بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على من كان نبيا وآدم بين الماء والطين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على هذا النبي الكريم والسيد السند العظيم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم افتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل ويسر أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا ووفقنا للعمل فيما يرضيك عنا بجاه نبيك المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وبسر الفاتحة Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the heavens and the earth. And we praise Him and we thank Him for gathering us and bringing us together for no other reason and purpose save to remember Him and remember His beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing, the blessing of remembering Allah and remembering His messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. For we live in a time where the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the remembrance of His beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam has become a secondary matter in the lives of people and uh, indulgence into the matters of the dunya and worldly affairs has become central and primary to the lives of people. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gathering us in something which is somewhat not normal and usual for, for people of our day and age which is to remember Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant us an increase in this favor and in this blessing of His, of remembering Him and remembering His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to send His peace, blessings and rest upon our Master, our Teacher, our Guide the coolness of our eyes, the strength of our hearts the beloved of Allah, Sayyidina Muhammad al-Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send peace and blessings upon his family, his companions, and all of those who followed after them with goodness and excellence up until the day of standing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us from amongst those people by virtue of them. Ameena, ameena, ameen. Thereafter, Speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and studying about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is something very central to our religion. It's so central that the Quran al kareem where it speaks about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it also speaks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the scholars have said, if you look into the worships that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, obliges upon us, uh, Wherever we find the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll always find the remembrance and the mention of his, master, uh, of his beloved Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So for example, uh, Imam ibn Atayullah radiyallahu anhu, he says, in prayer, where we stand up and we say in Surah Al-Fatiha, in the opening chapter, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone we worship and from you alone we take help and assistance. Right, this is direct worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the same prayer, we also remember the Prophet وسلم, in a very similar manner. When we stand in Surah Al Fatiha and we say, Iyaka, you alone, and we're addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. Likewise, when we sit uh, uh, in the sitting, in the tashahud, we say, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhal nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you, messenger of Allah. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mercy. So the way we say, Iyaka, you alone we worship. That's the same way we say, As-salamu alayka, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So our prayer is... Uh, worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also a remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we're going to try to find out why 
uh, the mention of the Prophet وسلم, is so important in this prayer. Then if we look at the call to prayer, uh, we look at the call to prayer, the Adhan. In the Adhan, where the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is said out aloud and the people are brought together by the hearing of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in the same Adhan we also have the mentioning of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we look at the mentioning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first shahada within the Adhan, it's Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And if we look at the next one, the mentioning of the Prophet sallallahu the words are very similar. Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Very similar. Then the scholars have said that when the khatib, when the, 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 the imam, he stands upon the member every week and he delivers khutbah and a sermon and a reminder uh, and teaches the people about their religion, there will not be a single khutbah of Jum'ah which is empty of mention of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and empty of the verse in which Allah says, "Surely Allah and His angels send peace and blessings and benedictions upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam." O believing people, send peace and blessings upon him as it is due to be sent upon him sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when we are reminded about our religion, when we're taught about our religion, we're taught about Allah subhanahu wa taala, but there is never. Uh, 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 there, there is never a missing out of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is always mentioned sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We perform Hajj. We perform Hajj, which is an utmost worship to Allah subhanahu wa taala. People leave their homes, they leave their families, they leave their businesses, they leave their wealth behind. For whom? For Allah subhanahu wa taala. But what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said? He said, "Khuzu maza anni." Take the rituals of Hajj from me, i.e. the way you see me performing the rituals of Hajj, that's how you should perform your rituals of Hajj. So uh, every single worship that we can imagine that can cross our minds, it has the Prophet wasallam there within that worship a center point. Without him wasallam, there is no reaching to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no knowing of the divine, there is no learning about the divine and about uh, the religion of Islam without the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, why is it that in every single prayer, where we remember Allah directly and we address Allah subhanahu wa taala directly, we also address the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam directly? Why is it that in the adhan when the muaddin stands, when he mentions Allah's name, he doesn't miss out mentioning the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's name? Why is it that the one who makes Hajj, when he makes so much sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he never misses out mention of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and never misses out on imitating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst making his Hajj. And likewise, all of the other worships of Islam are exactly in the same way. Why is this? Why is this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained this for every believing person so that their connection to the divine so that their path to the divine to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only one path and that's through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that's number one and number two so that the people don't forget their loyalty with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, when they say the adhan and they remember Allah the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala, the endless, the limitless subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they don't forget that they only reach the divine and re only reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look into the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about obedience, when he speaks about uh, people obeying Allah and listening to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? He said, مَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ those who obey Allah and His Messenger. Obey Allah and His Messenger. This is one stage. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it a stage further. And He says, وَمَن يُطِعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ And the one who obeys the Messenger, surely he has obeyed, who obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said to the companions, 
kullu ummati yadkhuluna aljannata illa man aba the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said all of my ummah will enter into the gardens of paradise except those who reject and the sahaba were puzzled they were puzzled they said wa man ya'ba ya rasulullah and who would reject and who would deny and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam replied and he said man ata'ani man ata'ani dakhala aljanna wa man asani faqad aba he who obeys me i muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he shall enter into paradise and he who disobeys me he has rejected and he has denied he has rejected look at the level that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been placed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that admission to the gardens of paradise is through obedience of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and uh, uh, being blocked and barred from the gardens of paradise is due to what uh, rejecting and denying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how is he rejected and how is he denied when he is disobeyed sallallahu alaihi wasallam when people don't want to uh, hear what he says and obey what he says sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam his position in this religion is absolutely central absolutely central and we can learn this from the lives of the sahaba and uh, the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and the relationship the sahaba had with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam let's take some examples the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam lived in makkah al-mukarramah where he was born for 40 years he lived in makkah al-mukarramah for 40 years from his birth till the age of 40 and no one knew him as a prophet no one knew him as a messenger all they knew him of is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is the son of Abdullah his mother's name was Amina his grandfather's name was Abdul Muttalib his uncle's name was Abu Talib Hamza Abbas and Harith and others right and this is how he was known in Makkah al-Mukarramah by his fam family lineage but he was also known as as sadiq al-Amin the most truthful and the most trustworthy sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is before they he told them that he was a prophet before his announcement of being a prophet but when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam moved into the cave of hira and he worshiped allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that cave and jibril alayhi salam came to him and he gave him revelation and then he was instructed by allah to go out and call these people to what call them to worshiping allah one god worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without associating anything or anyone to him why because he is divine subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the almighty he is the all powerful he is he is the creator of all of all of existence subhanahu wa ta'ala so when he went out his job was to call the people to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when he stand, stood upon the mountain of makkah uh, to call people together and collect them right and once they had collected and come together uh, uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stood upon the mountain what did he say he said to the people what do you know about me and they said well you're the most trustworthy and you're most truthful and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to them if i inform you that from behind this mountain an army is coming if i inform you that from behind this mountain army is coming that will uh, is coming to wage war against you would you believe me and the people said ma jarrabna alayka kadhiba we've never experienced you lie we've never experienced you lie you've lived the most decent life you've lived the most purest of life you've lived the most cleanest of life you've lived in the most perfect way we've never heard you lie we've never experienced you lie lie we've never come across anyone who's ever said that you've ever lied so if you tell us that, that there's a mount, uh, 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 an army coming from behind the mountain, we're going to believe you. We're going to trust you. And the Prophet sallallahu said, if your lev levels of trust, if your levels of trust in me are so much, if your levels of trust in me are so high, that if I inform you that there was an army from behind the mountain coming to destroy you or wage war against you, you would believe me then listen to what I've got to say. Then listen to what I've got to say. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ informed them that he had been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a messenger, as a Bashir and as a Nadir, as the one who gives good news to people about Allah, about the hereafter, about the gardens of paradise. And he also warns people against the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on. But the point here is, the point here is, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he speak about first? Trust that and so much. Well done. What's your name? Habib. Habib, mashallah. That's excellent. When he wanted to speak about Allah, how did he introduce things? How did he begin? He didn't say to them, uh, Allah is the creator of the world, Allah is the sustainer of the world, Allah feeds you, Allah created you, Allah gives you everything. He didn't say any of that. He stood upon the mountain and he introduced himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he wanted people, he wanted to know from the people how they thought about him, how they knew him, and what they knew about him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, the most important factor in the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, teaching the people was what? Himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That was the most important factor in his teaching to the people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was himself sallallahu alayhi wa So he said to them, because your levels of trust and your levels of confidence in me is so high that if I were to inform you about the unseen from behind this mountain, you would not reject, you would not deny, then listen to what I've got to say. I'm informing you about the unseen from beyond the seven heavens. I'm informing you of the unseen from beyond the seven heavens and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me with. So the most important uh, step in our religion in drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is who? Is having an introduction to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Introducing ourselves, i.e. Uh, exposing ourselves, letting ourselves know who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. And as our knowledge in the, tr uh, in the truthfulness, in the truthfulness, in the sincerity, and in the trust of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam increases, that's how our iman in Allah, our faith in Allah, our belief in Allah will increase. Will increase. So by learning about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our understanding about Allah will increase. By learning Allah alayhi wa sallam, our knowledge uh, about this religion will increase through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first point that the Meccans spoke, uh, the, uh, the first point that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke to the Meccans about was himself. He introduced himself. Before he introduced Allah, he introduced himself. Now let's look at uh, the aftermath, what happened after this initial meeting in Makkah? What happened? Those people who knew the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very well, who knew him very well. And who are the people who know you very well? Habib, what do you think? Who are the people who know you very, very well? Give me one person. Um, my mom. Your mom, excellent. Your parents know you very well. Uh, who else? If you're married, your wife or your husband. Yeah. Your children. Your best friends. Right? Your best friends who you grew up with from school days. And you still know them. You still play football with them. You still hang around with them. They know you very well. Right? And, those, and the people who are extremely close to you, so your parents, your husband or your wife, your children, your best friends from a very young age, all of these are extremely close to you. And if, uh, if you have servants, your servants know you extremely well. Why? Because they live in your house. They serve you all the time. Is that clear? Right? Now, when the Prophet ﷺ introduced himself, all of the people of Makkah said, you know what? You're truthful. You're trustworthy. You're fine. 
We've never had you lie. We've never had anything bad about you. Huh? That's his first shahada. That's his first witnessing from the people of Makkah. Then the next witnessing is a more intimate witnessing. It's a more close witnessing. It's a, a close circuit, you know, CCTV, a close circuit uh, uh, witnessing by those who are extremely close to him. So when he announced this, who was the first person to become Muslim? Who knows? Well, then what's your name? Mudassar. Who's the first person to become Muslim? Khadija. Khadija radiallahu anha. And who was Khadija? Excellent, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wife, right? She could have said, uh, for example, if he came back and said, uh, <clears throat> if the Prophet sallallahu wasn't as he was saying to the people and as he was introducing himself, he said, yeah, yeah you can, it's easy saying that out in the open, but I know how, exactly how you are at home. But you know the Prophet sallallahu the way he was outside in society, that was exactly the way he was inside at home. Sometimes it's very easy to, uh, uh, to, to be different outside the home. To be different outside the home. To be very kind, nice, gentle, soft. But when, you, when people come back into their homes, the scenario changes. Right? Like uh, I give Juma Khutbah at a school. It's a primary school. So I say to the kids, the way you're very nice with your teachers, they say, yes, please. Thank you, miss. Right? Do you do the same to your parents at home? And the story sometimes is very different. But the Prophet sallallahu because Sayyida Khadija, his wife, became Muslim immediately, what does this indicate? That the way he was introducing himself was absolutely correct. Then who else became Muslim? Who? Go ahead. Ali. Ali What's your name? Bilal. Bilal. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an. How old was he when he became Muslim? Seven. Seven. Right? Seven or eight when he became Muslim. He was a very young lad. Right? And how close was the, uh, Sayyidina Ali to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, The Prophet Sallallahu had an uncle, his name was Abu Talib. And Abu Talib had lots of kids. Right? And he was a poor man. And he couldn't really look after all of his kids. So the Prophet Sallallahu said to another one of his uncles, Sayyidina Abbas, he said, how about we go to my uncle and we help him look after his children. You take, you take one of his kids and look after him, and then I'll take another kid, and I'll look after him. And the Prophet said, fine. They went to uh, Abu Talib, and Abu Talib said, you can take any of my children, but just don't take Aqil. Right? Aqil was his favorite. So the Prophet ﷺ took Ali, and Sayyidina Abbas took Ja'far. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ took Sayyidina Ali, and he grew up, Sayyidina Ali grew up in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? As a young lad, he grew up, in the house of the Prophet and when he, when the Prophet announced and introduced himself, he accepted straight away. You know why? Because that introduction was absolutely correct. It was a reflection of the Prophet who else became Muslim immediately. What was the name of his friend who became Muslim immediately? Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, became Muslim immediately. And you know Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he was no normal person in Makkah. Sayyidina Abu Bakr was extremely wealthy. Sayyidina Abu Bakr came from a very prestigious family. Sayyidina Abu Bakr was known for his humbleness and for his goodness across Makkah to Mukarram. People knew Sayyidina Abu Bakr to be a, a righteous, a very decent uh, and a very nice person. And he was very rich, Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And he came from a very, uh, uh, a, 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 a very prestigious family. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr, when he heard this from the Prophet, he accepted straight away. It was as if he was saying, we've been waiting for this announcement for a long time. We've been waiting for this introduction for a long time. All of these people became Muslim instantly. Not because they had Allah said this and Allah said that. Not because they had, Allah said, make Hajj of the Kaaba and fast in Ramadan. Not because they had, Allah said, pray five times a day. Not because they had, Allah said, give zakat. Not because they had, Allah said, uh, 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 um, uh, this ruling of Islam or that ruling of Islam. 
Not because of any of the rulings of Islam did these people become Muslim. They became Muslim because of their introduction to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And they brought others to Islam through whom? By introducing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By introducing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you imagine the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam after the age of 40, he lived for another, how long? How many years did he live in Mecca? After that, how long did he live in Mecca? Another 13 years, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived in Mecca. Up to the age of 53, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed in Mecca. Do you know he never fasted any Ramadan in Mecca? Why? The rulings of Ramadan did not, uh, were not revealed until Medina al Munawwara. They weren't revealed until Medina al Munawwara. Hajj did not become an obligation until Medina al Munawwara. And so many of the rulings of Islam did not become obligation until Medina, uh, until Medina al Munawwara. What was happening in, in Mecca? People were, were turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the introduction of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at this. We all know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had enemies in Mecca. People didn't like him after he said, I'm a prophet. Allah has made me a prophet. And he's made me a messenger. And he's given me a book. And he sent me with the religion of Islam. Some people were jealous about this. Some people, they denied the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do you know what? They never ever denied the Prophet being truthful sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They never denied this. Imam al-Shami radiallahu an mentions in his encyclopedia on the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. He mentions that at night time, the elite of the kuffar of Mecca, people like Abu Jahl, people like Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan who is not yet Muslim, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan and others, when night would fall, what would they do? They would go hide around the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the evening. They would hide around the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the evening. They would hide from each other and hide from the eyes of people. And what would they do? The Prophet sallallahu would stand and recite Quran in prayer and they would go listen to the Quran from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would listen to the Quran. Why? Because of the melodious voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of the magical nature of the verses of the Quran al kareem Because of the magical nature of the uh, verses of the Quran al kareem and how they penetrated into the hearts of those whose Arabic was at its peak. One night, when they were hiding around the house of the Prophet ﷺ, they were hiding from each other. They didn't want each other to know. And they didn't want people to know. Why? Because all day long, they're speaking against the Prophet. And if people see them at night around the house of the Prophet ﷺ, people are going to say, hang on, what's happening here? You go around to his house in the evening, and in the daytime, you're abusing and insulting. One night, Imam Shami says that one night, they dispersed and they left. And guess what? Two of them met up in the street. Each of them asked the other, where have you been? And they were kind of wary now, become a bit worried. What do I say? And he said, um, well, I've been the same place you've been. He says, Hajib, this is strange. What were you doing there? Why did you go? And both of them, they decided, they said, we swear by Allah, Muhammad is not a liar. Sallallahu alayhi wa We've only denied his message because he comes from the, I mean, he comes from the, he comes from the family of Bani Hashim. Right? He comes from the family of Bani Hashim. So when the family of Bani Hashim boasts and they say, we have a prophet amongst us, what will we say? We'll say, we don't have a prophet. So because we can't match up to what they have, we've opposed them. So their reason for opposing was not because they didn't trust the Prophet Why? They were well aware of the Prophet Their introduction to Muhammad was such that even though they denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the signs and the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they never denied the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reason for their disbelief in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't because he's not truthful, wasn't because he's not trustworthy, wasn't because they had not seen quality in him, but the reason for their uh, denial was jealousy, was envy. If the family of Bani Hashim say, we've got a Prophet, 
what are we going to turn around and say? We don't have anything. We don't have anyone to match. Which means what? Which means the level of their comprehension and their understanding of the reality of Muhammad وسلم, was such that they knew we cannot say we have a fake prophet because of the Prophet وسلم, high qualities and high standards. Did you hear that? Did you get that? Even the, the kuffar of Makkah, they realized the status and the realities of Muhammad وسلم, so much that they couldn't just say, oh, well, okay, you have a prophet, this person's a prophet from amongst us. They couldn't say that. Why? Because where would they have bought someone with the qualities of Muhammad, someone with the beauties of Muhammad, someone with the perfections of Muhammad, someone with the trust of Muhammad, someone with the truthfulness of Muhammad All of those qualities of 40 years that they had been exposed to, introduced to, where would, those, where would they bring them from? They knew that there was no way of bringing these qualities from anyone or anywhere. This is <coughs> divine. This has come to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the importance of being introduced to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That those people, even though their ending was that they were disbelievers. Their ending was that they were disbelievers. But never were they disbelievers because they denied or did not trust the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If they did not trust him, they, they would not go and sit outside his house. They would not go sit outside his house and listen to the Quran. There was a businessman who used to... Remember, Makkah al-Mukarramah was a city which was also the center of business. Why? Because Makkah al-Mukarramah across the Arabian Peninsula had an attraction point. What was the attraction point? The Kaaba al-Musharrafah. The Kaaba al-Musharrafah was the attraction point of Makkah al-Mukarramah long before Islam, from the days that Ibrahim alayhi salam built it, the, 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 the people in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, before he announced he's a prophet, the people in his parents' time, his grandparents' time, right the way back to the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, from across the Arabian Peninsula, they would come and make Hajj in Makkah al-Mukarramah, they would make tawaf of the Kaaba al-Musharrafah, it was always deemed to be a sacred house. Which means, when you have a sacred house like the Kaaba al-Musharrafah, and people flock from all corners, they will bring their merchandise with them. Right? They'll, they'll put out their stalls outside the Kaaba, outside uh, the masjid. And they'll do business and buy and sell, and people from different areas will be interested in things that come from uh, other areas from across the Arabian Peninsula. So it was like a center point. There were people who would come from Saudi Arabia, from Yemen. Amongst them was a very, very, very influential and af uh, affluential business person, Tufail al Dosi. Tufail. Now, Tufail, he always came to Makkah. When he came to Makkah, he would meet up with the people of Makkah and he knew them very well. One time he came to Makkah to Mukarramah and uh, the elite of Makkah, when he went to meet them, and they said to him, be very careful this time out. I said, why is that? They said, uh, there is a man from amongst us. He is, uh, he is insulting our gods. Remember, they worship the idols. He's insulting our gods. He is speaking against our gods. He's breaking up families, parents and children, uh, husbands and wife, and so on. Don't listen to him. Uh, if you go, when you go make tawaf around the Kaaba, put your fingers in your ears and make tawaf. Right? Put your fingers in your ears and make the off so you don't even hear what he says. Now, why would they say to him, put your fingers in your ears? Why? I mean, they could have merely said to him, he's going to be preaching, don't listen to him. You get on with your business, make the off, do what, you, what, what you've got to do and carry on. Why did they say to him, put your fingers in your ears? You know why? Because they knew if the melodious words of Muhammad reach his ears, they will only drop into his heart like honey. They will only drop into his heart like honey and his heart will be captured and mesmerized by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and his beauties. Which means even the kuffar of Makkah, they knew the rank, the status, 
the perfections, the goodness that Allah Azza wa Jal had bestowed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that anyone who hears his words will be taken. So what did Tufayl do? He listened to them because he was very familiar to them, he had friends. He puts his uh, fingers in his uh, ears and he begins to make tawaf. Whilst he's making tawaf, he probably felt a bit silly with his fingers in his ears walking around the Kaaba al-Musharrafah. He thought to himself, I'm a very intelligent person. I'm a very intelligent person. I'm a knowledgeable person. Let me hear what he's got to say. Let me hear what he's got to say. Uh, if he says anything good, then fine. I, I listen to it. And if he says something which my intelligence, my knowledge uh, does not match with, I'll say, I'll, I'll leave it. Huh? Why not listen to him? It's like, Sheikh Hamza mentions that uh, there's a book called Don't Say Don't. Don't say, don't. Because every time you say don't, someone's going to actually go and do that. Is that clear? So they, they said to him, don't listen to him. So he thought, you know what? Let's go and check it out. Let's go and check it out. Is that okay? Uh, that's why he mentions that uh, don't say, uh, I, I don't know, uh, if uh, children are running, don't say don't run. Say, walk sensibly. Right? Because then they've got something to do. And likewise in the Quran al karim when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, instructs and he prohibits, the instructions are first and the prohibitions are after. يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ They encourage uh, and enjoin goodness first and secondly what do they do? They forbid and forbid and prohibit from badness and evil. So encouragement comes first, uh, instruction towards good comes first, and then if there's any uh, discrepancies and if there's any uh, thing that needs to be removed, then uh, the nahi, the prohibition comes after. So they said to him, don't do this. So he said, hang on, let me just check it out. So he pulls his fingers out of his ear and he walks over to the Prophet And the Prophet was sitting and he was speaking to the Sahaba and he went and listened. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he said, say some, inform me of something. And the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Al-Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say Allah. Say he Allah is one. Allah is samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. The man accepted Islam. He accepted straight away. Why? Because these words were words of perfection. These words were words which came from a pure mouth and struck a heart. They came from a pure mouth and they struck a heart. Right? So the point that uh, we want to highlight in this whole story was what? That the kuffar of Mecca, why did they say to Tufayl al Dosi, put your fingers in your ears and don't listen to him? Because even they knew his words are so sweet, his words are so eloquent, his words are so, so beautiful, his words are so perfect that anyone who hears them will be taken by them. And they were taken by these words themselves. The kuffar of Makkah were taken by these words. But what prevented them and what barred them and blocked them from accepting his way were not these words. And was not that they did not know the Prophet ﷺ, but rather they denied the signs of Allah. Rather, they deny the sign of Allah that Allah gives to whom he, whomsoever He wishes. Allah said in the Quran that they said, uh, if this was a true religion, if this, what, what came to the Prophet ﷺ, if this was correct and if it was true, then Allah would, would have given it to uh, the, uh, one of the men of the two cities. And Allah replied to them, and Allah said, أَهُمْ يَقْسِمُونَ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّكَ are they the distributors of Allah's mercy? نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا It is us who have divided livelihood amongst people and raised some over others. Right? So, having an introduction to the Prophet Sallallahu knowing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more a person knows the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the closer he draws to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Look from amongst the Sahaba, we gave the example of Sayyidina Abu Bakr that he accepted Islam instantly, immediately. So much so that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, anyone who I presented Islam to had a slight doubt, 
had some questions, had some uh, queries, had some uh, uh, thoughts about it, except Abu Bakr. When I introduced and presented Islam to Abu Bakr, he accepted it straight away, without any questions, without any queries, without any thought, he accepted straight away. Do you know why he accepted straight away? Because his introduction to the Prophet ﷺ was much greater than any other Makkah, was much greater than any other person in the Arabian Peninsula. Why? Because he grew up with the Prophet ﷺ with it from a young age. He spent his teens with him. He spent his 20s with him. He spent his 30s with him. He spent his 40s with him. He spent his day and night with the Prophet ﷺ. And this introduction to the Prophet ﷺ's life, day and night, highlighted to him that whatever this man says is it has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So introducing ourselves to the Prophet ﷺ is absolutely crucial, absolutely important. Its importance is so much that the great Imam, a scholar of hadith and scholar of tafsir, Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin, radiallahu an, he says in his work on the shama'il, on the characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Wujubu at-ta'arrufi ala janabi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said it is an obligation. It's an obligation. It's a must. It's an absolute necessity upon every individual to be well acquainted and equipped with knowledge concerning the person of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? And he mentions reasons as to why. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands from us, Allah demands from each of us that we have faith in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah said, Aminu billahi wa rasooli. Have faith in Allah and in his messenger. Wal-nuri alladhi anzalna. And in the lights that we have revealed. The Shaykh said, and how is it possible that you can have faith you can have confidence, you can have trust in someone who you don't know anything about. Someone who you don't know anything about. How can you have confidence in them? How can you have uh, trust in them? How can you have faith and belief in them without knowing them? Without knowing how they lived, without knowing the thoughts of their mind. So he said this is the first reason why it's a must upon each and every individual to get to know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, know his qualities, that his qualities were beyond the qualities of any other man. His qualities were beyond the qualities of any other man, and Allah subhanahu wa taala introduces these qualities in the Quran al-Karim one after the other, one after the other concerning the person of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then the Shaykh he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obliged us after having faith and belief in him he's obliged us to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now tell me everyone knows about love everyone knows about love how can you love someone you don't know how can you love someone you haven't heard about how can you love someone whom you've never seen? How can you love someone whom you have no contact with? How can you love someone who you don't know anything about their surroundings? You don't know about their day and night. You don't know anything about them. How can you love them? But this question that I'm asking now has not become a strange question in the world that we live in. This question is no longer a strange question in the world that we live in. For we have people making relationships over Facebook and Twitter with people whom they don't know. They don't know their surroundings. They don't know their day and night. They don't know their morning and evening. They don't know their friends. They don't know their acquaintance. They don't know their work. They don't know their business. But they have fallen in love. With whom? Someone you don't know. And you try to speak sense to them. Men and women, girls and boys. You try to speak sense to them. So you've never seen this person. But it doesn't matter, I've been speaking to them. 
I, I've, had, I've had conversations with them for two years over the net. You try to speak some sense to these young people that how can you love someone you don't know? How can you love someone? But they say, but I know this person. How can you love someone you've never seen? How can you love someone you don't know where they live, what their surroundings are, who their family is, who their parents are? And how many a time have there been relationships over Facebook and Twitter? And when the two parties meet, they were absolutely uh, alien to what they were saying on the net. Absolutely alien, absolutely different to what they were saying over the net. It's a strange world we live in. People give their hearts into people whom they don't know. They give their hearts and the, the most, the most beautiful thing within their heart, love to people whom they don't know, people who they've not been introduced to, people who they don't know who their family is, they don't know who their parents are, they don't know who their siblings are, they don't know who they grew up with, who their friends are, who their acquaintance are, what they do as a job, what their profession is, they don't know anything about them, they've never seen them and they say, I've fallen in love. What type of love is this? You. And, and this heart, such a precious point in, in a human being, you've just given it so easily away. Whether men or women, girls or boys, this is the story that we hear day and night from across, uh, across this country, from the pinnacle of Scotland to the depth of Devon, across this country, it's the same story. From one Muslim house to another, from one Muslim area to another, Muslims have given their hearts away to people whom they don't know. When Muslims had their heart as a treasure for the one whom they know, for the one whom Allah Azza wa Jal introduced to them. Allah introduces in the Quran al karim his wives to us. Allah introduces his children to us. Allah introduces his parents to us. Allah introduces his city to us. Allah introduces the earth that he tread upon to us in the Quran al karim Allah introduces his life to us. Allah introduces his birth to us. Allah introduces every moment of his life to us in the Quran al karim and says, this is the one you're supposed to love, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Allah says, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I've exposed him to you so much that there isn't a second from amongst, the, from amongst the seconds of his life. There isn't an hour from the hours of his life. There isn't a moment from the moments of his life. There isn't a thought from the thoughts of his mind. There isn't a beat from the beats of his heart, except that every believing person upon this earth knows what he was thinking at that particular point in history. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. The Muslims have given their hearts away. Who have you given your heart to? Oh, someone I met on the net. Someone I heard about. Well, how do you know this person is speaking the truth? How do you know they're speaking the truth about their profession? How do you know they're speaking the truth about their age? How do you know they're speaking the truth about their, their family? Uh, my, my father's a pious imam. My father's a righteous man. I come from a very good family. And you meet them and they're the most wretched of, of people. How do you know these people? Well, they're speaking to you as an individual. And how many other individuals are they speaking to? The world has become too fast track. The world has become too fast track for a human being to live as a human being. To live as a human being, the world has become too fast. This is why Allah Azza wa Jal said to us in the Quran, you want to live as a human being, whether you're a man or a woman. Allah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Surely in the messenger of Allah you have the most beautiful example. Beautiful of example for 1400 years ago. And I swear by Allah the great, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Beautiful example for our days. For our days. Just go and find someone who reflects the Prophet who imitates the Prophet who mirrors the Prophet place them in front of a Muslim, place them in front of a Christian, place them in front of a Jew, place them in front of a Sikh, place them in front of a Hindu, place them in front of someone who doesn't believe in God and they'll say this man is so beautiful, this woman is so godly. This is what they will say. Why? Imitators of Muhammad become a people who become attraction points for creation.
they become attraction points for other human beings. I can give you examples. I can give you examples after examples of men and women who imitated Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and became points of attraction. I'll start with an example of a woman. A sister came from Austria. Last year to, uh, to one of our retreats, a sister came from Austria, Sister Aisha. She's originally from Thailand. Originally from Thailand. Uh, uh, originally, sorry, from Taiwan. Originally from Taiwan. She, and then she moved to Austria. And then she accepted Islam. And her story of Islam, we'll mention it another time here, inshallah. But the point that we want to mention here is how when people become reflections of Muhammad in the 21st century, they become points of attraction to human beings and the rest of Allah's creation. She said, I became Muslim. She said, I lived outside Vienna, the capital of Austria. I lived outside Vienna, the capital of Austria, and I would travel from where I lived into Vienna twice a week, every single week, to buy my groceries, buy my halal meat, and so on and so forth. She said, I would be in my hijab. I would be dressed as a modest Muslim woman. She said, a few years later, I walked into a gathering of sisters in Austria. I walked into a gathering of sisters, and suddenly this one sister grabbed me and said, it's you. I said, sister, I've never met you before. It's the first time we've, been, we've introduced ourselves to each other. She said, no, it's you. I saw you upon that train for two years in this modest dress in your hijab and i said what a beautiful woman what a what a modestly dressed woman i saw you and i saw the reflection of islam within you i saw a beauty in you i saw goodness in you that brought me to this religion of islam sister aisha said i never spoke to her we never had contact but she just saw me and she was taken she saw me and she was taken it doesn't matter who the people are. People might think our religion, it started 1400 years ago. It started 1400 years ago. But you know our religion is for every moment until the day of standing. Whether people understand that or not, people like to deny the truth. And sometimes not explicitly but implicitly within their hearts, they just deny it. They want to cover up things. You know why? Because they want to go with the trends of society. They want to push along and move along and fast food and fast track like society. But within that they find no comfort, no solace, they find no peace, they don't find no harmony. And when they don't find harmony and comfort and peace in the trends of people, they begin to deny the true trends of comfort and peace because they don't want to direct themselves towards that. They don't want to direct themselves towards us. And you know why they, want to, why they don't want to direct themselves towards us? What will people say? What a strange person you are. What will people say? Tell me, what did the people say to Abu Bakr? What a strange man you are. You're following Muhammad, who's being followed by these slaves and these poor people. The destitute of Makkah. They were the ones around Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But tell me, did they not become the Sada and the Qada and the leaders of this ummah until the day of judgment. Bilal, Sayyiduna Bilal, radiallahu anhu, the black African companion of Sayyiduna Muhammad. He was a slave in Mecca, but he's become the crown of our heads until the day of judgment. He's become the crown of kings until the day of judgment. He's a man who tread the earth, but his footsteps could be heard in the gardens of paradise. They could be heard in the gardens of paradise. Through what? Through being introduced to Sayyiduna Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Everyone, each and every one of us, what are we chasing after in the world? Everyone wants a comfortable life. Everyone wants peace of mind. Everyone wants a, a heart that's had tran a tranquil heart and a peaceful heart. And they're running like headless chickens here, there, everywhere. Have a morning job, have a, twi uh, a twilight job, have a weekend job, have a job and a job and a job. Why? They think this jam of the dunya, this gathering, this connecting of the dunya is going to give us some solace. It's going to give us some comfort. It's going to give us some peace. Tell me, was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not the one whose heart had the most comfort, whose heart had the most peace, whose heart 
have the most tranquility within it and his companions and their hands were empty of the dunya. Their hands were empty of the dunya. The Prophet wasallam said, the mountains of Makkah were presented to me in gold and silver and I denied them. I refused them. Where did he find comfort from sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? His comfort did not come from gold and silver. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they sacrificed everything at the fate of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They sacrificed everything for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because when they were introduced to him, when they realized who he was, when they saw his person in reality sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, there was nothing greater in this world than Muhammad Just the story of that companion who some say he was Khabbab ibn Arat and some say he was another in Makkah al-Mukarramah. He was a poor man and the kuffar of Makkah crucified him. And as they were crucifying him, they said to him, would you not like Muhammad to be in your place and you to be comfortable in the midst of your family? Just listen to the statement. Listen to the statement. Why did they have so much sacrifice? Would you not like for Muhammad to be hung up here and you to be in the comfort of your family? What was the reply of this man? Look, hear the reply of those who were introduced to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. What did he say? He said, I would not like that I be here being crucified and slain and Muhammad sallallahu be in his home, in the comfort of his family, and that a thorn harms him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That a thorn harms him. I wouldn't like a thorn to harm him, let alone him go through what I'm going through. Why did these people sacrifice so much? Why? Because you know when they were introduced to Muhammad <coughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they fell in love with him. And now what we have Muslims falling in love with, we don't know what they're falling in love with. Previously they'd fall in love with gold and silver. Now they're falling in love with people they've never seen. They don't know if they're speaking the truth or lying. Behind screens. They're destroying their families. For these people on Facebook. Who are living fake lives. Absolute fake life. Social media. Muslims don't need social media. Muslims have hearts that are pumping with life. People who have life, people who are, whose, whose hearts are miserable, people whose hearts are destroyed, people whose hearts are distressed, I need a social media. People whose hearts are alive, they are alive with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't need anyone in this planet and they'll be the most happiest of people upon earth. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak radiallahu an, one of the greatest, greatest imams of this ummah, one of the most elect of people of this ummah, listen to what he says. He would pray in the local masjid like everyone else. He would pray his fard and he'd rush out. He'd pray his fard and what would he do? He would rush out. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barika ala Sayyidina Muhammad. He would rush out. People stopped him one day and said, Ibn al-Mubarak, where are you going? You've never prayed your sunnah prayers with us. Why don't you chill out? Stick around. We'll have a convo. Maybe we can have a meal. We'll go out together. Why don't you stay around? Ibn al-Mubarak, why don't you socialize with us? Listen to the answer of Ibn al-Mubarak. Ibn al-Mubarak radiallahu anh said to them, how can I socialize with you when Muhammad and his companions are waiting for me at home? How can I socialize with anyone upon the earth when Muhammad and his companions are waiting in my house? And Ibn al-Mubarak wasn't in the time of the Prophet. He wasn't in the time after that. He was in one of the earlier generations who didn't see the Prophet. How was the Prophet and his companions in his house? He said, I returned to my house hastening and rushing. I opened up the books of Hadith and I read, Qala Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah said, and it's as if I'm sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and receiving from him directly sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to socialize our media. Wake up Muslims, as Shaykh Hamza used to say. Wake up from the fake life. Wake up from dreaming. We don't need to socialize with anyone. We have the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Allah, Shaykh Abdullah Sirajuddin makes a second point. The first point, he said, we need to introduce ourselves to the Prophet because Allah says, have Iman in him. How can he 
have Iman in someone you don't know. And then it moves along. Then it increases. You have to love him. How can you love him when you don't know him? But the problem is now in our times, you can love someone without knowing them. And that's not a human being. That's not natural. If you say to a child, if you speak to a child about someone and say, love this person, they say, I don't know this person. I'm not, I can't love a person I don't know. I can't love a person that I don't know. But the Sahaba were introduced to the Prophet the men of them and the women of them. The women of them were two. One companion, he said, when I was a young boy, I had a skin disease. When I was a young boy, I had a skin disease. My, and my aunt took me to the Prophet And they said, Ya Rasulullah, this child of ours has a skin disease. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, lift your shirt. And he lifted it. And the Prophet ﷺ wiped his blessed hand over the upper body of this child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him. He said, we returned home. And my mother and my aunt said to me, oh son, we've never seen someone more beautiful than Muhammad. We've never seen anyone more gentle than Muhammad. We've never seen anyone more compassionate than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The men, the women, the children, the young, the elderly, let alone the human beings, the animals would come and complain about their masters and about their owners to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, love him. And you know how much to love him? Allah said, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اِقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَنْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ فَتَرَبَّصُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that then abaukum your parents wa abnaukum your children wa ikhwanukum your brethren wa azwajukum your your wives or your spouses wa ashiratukum and your families and your tribes wa amwalun iqtaraftumuha and this wealth that you accumulate and earn wa tijaratun takhshawna kasadaha and your business that you fear that they might go bankrupt wa tijaratun takhshawna kasadaha wa masakin wa masakin tardawnaha and your lovely houses that you really enjoy. They become more beloved to you, Allah, than Allah and His Messenger and Jihad in His way. Allah said, then just wait for His punishment to come upon you. Wait for His punishment to come upon you. The Prophet said, None of you can have faith. Until I do not become more beloved to them than their parents, their children, and everyone in this world. You speak to a young person, say, relax, this relationship is haram, don't do this. The Prophet forbade, but I'm, I've fallen in love. Why wasn't your heart captured by the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And hence every love that comes after that would have stemmed from the love of Muhammad and it would have been pure. Why? Hearts have not been introduced. And the Muslim heart should be the museum of love of Muhammad and love sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When someone reaches the heart of a Muslim, they reach a museum of love and go through the galleries uh, and the art galleries uh, and the relics galleries of Muhammad and love. You walk through the heart of a believing person and what do you see? Stories of love opening up. Stories of connection to Muhammad opening up. Stories of affiliation and loyalty to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam opening up. One of the great scholars of hadith, one of the great scholars of hadith, he's still alive, the great man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We saw him always crying in the love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had some heart problems and he came for a heart scan. And as the doctor was scanning his heart, 
besides was the screen that the doctor was looking at. The doctor said to him, uh, do you want to see a sketch of your heart? Just turn to that screen. And the Sheikh began to cry. He began to cry. He said, don't show me my heart. And the doctor said, why? People enjoy looking at their heart. It's quite, it's quite exciting that someone shows you your inside and then the most important part of your body, your heart, that pumps blood across your entire body. And if it ceases, you're dead. So why people are fascinated by seeing the heart? People want to become heart surgeons from a young age because they're fascinated by this, by this piece of flesh. And the Sheikh cried. And the doctor said, please let me know why you're crying. And the Sheikh said, I don't want to see the sketch of my heart. For I fear if I don't see the imprint of the name of Muhammad upon it, I will die. If I don't see the imprint of the name of Muhammad upon my heart, I will cease to live. My life will end. This was a man to whose heart the love of Muhammad was the most precious thing. His heart was a museum of love for Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa barakatuh. And examples like this are numerous, hundreds in their millions and in their thousands. And they will appear before our eyes on the day of judgment, when the lovers of Muhammad will flock to him, and everyone will have a unique story. Everyone have, will have a unique love for him, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa This is the second point that the Shaykh makes. The third point the Shaykh makes is why we should introduce ourselves to Sayyidina Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. So that every time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned, every time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned, immediately we close our eyes and we can have an absolute sketch in our minds of the person of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An absolute sketch of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now if I mention in this gathering, the name of someone who's very famous in this country, let's say uh, David Cameron. Have you seen David, David Cameron, the prime, prime Minister? Everyone's seen the Prime Minister on television. If his name is mentioned, you don't feel alien, you don't feel foreign, you feel, okay, I know who you're speaking about. I know who you're speaking about. If, I, if someone comes to you and says, oh yeah, your father is, is so and so, and you think about your father, and they think about your father, and both of you are on the same wavelength, you see, feel a connection. If you meet someone and say, oh yeah, I know your brother. You meet someone, a sister meets someone, I know your mother, I know your sister. I went to school with your sister, with your aunt. You feel on the same wavelength. You feel that we're speaking about the same person. We've mentioned a name, but we know the entity behind that name. The Shaykh says, get to know the Prophet ﷺ. Introduce yourselves to the Prophet ﷺ. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about him, you're on the same wavelength and you know the entity behind that name, Muhammad ﷺ. You know the entity behind that name, Muhammad ﷺ. And this is one of the problems that we have, is that we know the name Muhammad, but we don't know the entity that lies behind the name Muhammad ﷺ. One of the great scholars said, he said, when I, uh, when I wanted to, when, when I would want to approach something, I would think, would the Prophet ﷺ do this or wouldn't he? Now he could think like that because he knew the entity that existed, the essence that existed behind the name of Muhammad ﷺ. So he could, he could look through the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ and see, was this present in the life of the Prophet ﷺ? What would the Prophet have approved to something like this and work it out? He says this is another reason why we need to introduce ourselves to the Prophet He said another reason. And he said that this particular reason was the sunnah of the Prophet Like for example, we've come from Birmingham. And if I speak to you about someone in Birmingham and just mention their name and job and so on, that's going to be okay. But if I start to describe them that they are very tall, they've got short hair, uh, a long beard, uh, and speak about their physical features, your mind will be inclined more. When the Prophet ﷺ returned from Mi'raj, this long journey, 
and he led all of the prophets and messengers in Masjid Al-Aqsa. When he came back, he said to the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhu, he said, Wa Musa, ka'annahu rajulun min shalu'a. As for Musa, alayhi salam, it was as if he was from the people of shalu'a. Now, the Sahaba who he was talking about, they knew exactly how the people of shalu'a looked like. So, because they knew how the people of Shanu'a looked like, they could make a, a sketch in their minds as to how Musa alayhi salam looked. Then he said, sallallahu alayhi as for Isa alayhi salam, he was a middle height man, he had redness in his skin, and his hair was wet as if he had come out of a shower. So this sketch brought close to them how Isa alayhi salam looked. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, وَأَمَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَأَنَا أَشْبَهُ وَلَدِهِ بِهِ As for Ibrahim, if you want to know how Ibrahim looked, then I am the most resembling of his children to him. I am the most resembling of his children to him. The scholars have said, when the Prophet sallallahu described the previous prophets, it brought the minds of the Sahaba closer to as to how they looked and their affiliation to those prophets became stronger. This is another reason why we need to introduce ourselves to the Prophet And the final reason that the Shaykh mentions, he says that a lover, a lover, when the beloved is mentioned to the lover, then it, love is stirred in the heart. Love is stirred in the heart and the soul begins to juggle and it begins to dance and it become, begins to become excited and it becomes ecstatic and it uh, reaches uh, heights of highness and uh, heights of uh, ec ecstasy when the beloved is mentioned, when the beloved is mentioned. Our teacher, the great Imam, Sheikh Saleh Farfur radiallahu anhu, he has a poem in which he speaks about the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he says, Ahyana hubbuka ya mukhtaru ahyana wa asbah al-haflu min zikraka nashwa'na. He said, Mukhtar is one of the names of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, O oh, Mukhtar, your life, uh, O oh, Mukhtar, your love has given us life. It's given us life. وَأَصْبَحَ الْحَفْلُ مِنْ ذِكْرَاكَ نَشْوَعْنَا And the gathering has become intoxicated through your remembrance. When people remember the Prophet ﷺ, they become excited. They become ecstatic. Their hearts begin to juggle. Their memories begin to be pulled towards the Prophet ﷺ. And then he speaks and he says, مَهْمَا كَتَمْتُ لَغَى شَوْقٍ يُؤَرِّقٌ قَدْ يَفْضَحُ الْقَلْبَ دَمْعُ الْعَيْنِ أَحْيَانًا He said, this love of the Prophet and this remembrance, I try, to, I try to hide it away. But what can I do? It's a burning fire that I can't extinguish and it keeps me awake at night. He speaks about the tears of his eyes. He said, لَوْ أَمْلِكُ الطَّرْفَ مَا أَسْلَمْتُ قَطْرَةَ مَا وَلَكِنَّ دَمْعِي كَمَوْجِ الْبَحْرِ تُغْيَانًا He said, if I was able then I would not have allowed a single tear to drop from my eyes. But what can I do? My eyes have begun to, uh, the tears of my eyes have begun to flow like the gushing waves of the ocean. Like the gushing waves of the ocean, my tears are coming out. What can I do? And he says about the remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, uh, the, the remembrance of the Prophet ﷺ, it shakes me huh? uh, out of love and remembrance. It moves me from my right to my left. The way the early morning breeze, a very soft, thin breeze, it moves the branches of the trees. This is how the wave of the love of Muhammad ﷺ moves my body. And Imam al-Busiri, the great Imam عنه, in the first chapter of his book, that what does he say? He said, أَمِنْ تَذَكُّرِ جِيرَانٍ بِذِي سَلَمٍ مَزَجْتَ دَمْعًا جَرَى مِنْ مُقْلَةٍ بِدَمٍ Is it because you remembered some very nice 
good neighbors in the salam that your eyes began to tear so much that they, your tears were mixed with blood. Why are you crying so much? Why are you crying so much? What's happening to you? The remembrance of the Prophet People who are exposed to his beauty, they forget all other. Nothing is beautiful before their eyes. And you know the early Muslims, <coughs> until our time, but we need to revive this in our hearts. When they would see Imam Ibn al-Jassus, al-Maghribi radiallahu an, he mentions in the commentary of his, Shama'il of the Prophet sallallahu He says that the people, the Muslims, when they would see someone with a beautiful, handsome face, they would say, As-salatu ala Rasulillah. They would say, peace and blessings upon the Messenger of Allah. You know why? Because the beauty and handsomeness of a person reminded them of the beauty of the Prophet When they would see beautiful flowers in a beautiful garden blossoming, they would say, As-salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah. Peace and blessings upon the Prophet for this blessing only. When they would put on atr and perfume and they would smell a beautiful scent and that scent would go through their, would through their nose and open up the arteries and the galleries of their hearts, they would remember the, the beautiful scent of the sweat of the Prophet Sallallahu and say, As-salatu was salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. They connected every beauty, every goodness to the beauty and the goodness of the Prophet Sallallahu this is why it's important that it, when we expose our hearts, we expose our homes, we expose our lives, we expose our minds, we expose everything that Allah has given us to the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ, to the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Just expose yourselves to him and then see what he sends to you. Love is not a one-way story. Love is never a one-way story. And when you begin to show those signs of love for him, then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the most loyal of lovers and the most loyal of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Imam al-Busiri radiallahu anhu he said, فَإِنَّ لِي ذِمَّةً بِتَسْنِيَةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَهُوَ أَوْفَ النَّاسِ بِالذِّمَمِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al-Busiri said, And I have a guarantee I have a guarantee because I have been named Muhammad. I have a guarantee because I have been named Muhammad. And through this naming, because I have this name Muhammad, then he who was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the most loyal of people who fulfilled their guarantees sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have to open up our hearts. We, we live in the fast world of the 21st century. Forget about that. We live... You know, Muslims, we live in the world of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And what gives us hope upon this earth is the tre the earth that we tread upon is the same earth that Muhammad tread upon sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What gives us hope is the sky that we see above us. This is the same sky that was above the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The moon that the moon that we see was the same moon that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw. The sun that we see is the same sun that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw. The atmosphere that Allah has given us, the opportunity that Allah has placed us in, is the opportunity of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And do you know what? We're living in the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For every prophet who came, the prophet after him who came, abrogated the rulings and the Sharia ah and the laws and the way of the previous prophet. But our beloved came, and there's no abrogations. There's no cancellations <coughs> from his day, from the day that he touched the earth and announced his prophecy. We're all under the sight of his mercy, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we have to open our hearts. We have to open the doors of our homes. It's very easy saying we have to open our hearts, but we have to open the doors of our homes to Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And remember, remember. The Prophet is not going to enter into a home where he will be displeased with something that he sees. If the Prophet said, angels do not enter into a house where there is a dog, then can you imagine the Prophet entering into a home where there are screens where naked women are exposed? Where, where there are screens where people are indecent, where there are screens where where innocent children 
are being shown the most horrific of scenes where there are screens in the bedrooms of innocent children allowed to watch indecency upon these screens. You think the Prophet's going to enter into homes like that? People, all we need to do is open up the doors of our hearts and the doors of our homes to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, you are most welcome into my heart. Ya Rasulullah, you are most welcome into my home. Please come into my home and become the beauty and the center point and the coolness of the eyes of my children. Please come into my home and become the comfort of my house. Please come into my home and bring tranquility and peace and bring nur and light, bring sweetness and fragrance into my home, Ya Rasulullah. We just have to open that door and then see how he comes in, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and see how he breaks the idols of the world from our hearts and from our homes. See how he rectifies the matters of our homes and the matters of our lives and the matters of our hearts and the matters of our dunya and the matters of our akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us a people who open up their hearts and their homes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, you are most welcome into our hearts. Ya Rasulullah, you are most welcome into our homes. Please accept this invitation, Messenger of Allah. Please accept this invitation, Ya Rasulullah. Oh Messenger of Allah, you were the most kindest of people. You were the most generous of people. You were the most compassionate of people. You were the best of people who would turn towards the worst of people. Messenger of Allah, we might be the worst of people that we have opened the doors of our hearts and the doors of our homes. So please come into our homes and our hearts so that we can smell the beautiful fragrance of your sweat so that we can be illuminated through the radiant light of your blessed face. As-salatu wassalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. So that we can live through the guidance of your sweet words that you recite from the Quran and the gems that you give us of your hadith, ya Rasulullah. Messenger of Allah, come into our homes with your blessed wives so our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, role models in your blessed wives. Messenger of Allah, please come into our homes with your grandchildren, Al Hassan and Hussein, so that the young of our Ummah, our young brethren, our young children, our young boys can have examples in your beautiful children, Al Hassan and Hussein. Please come into our homes with your friends, Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, Ali, Abu Huraira. Talha and Zubair and the likes of them so that we know who to befriend and the types of people to make friends, Ya Rasulullah. Oh Allah, we, are, we, we, we open up, we raise our hands to you and we ask you alone that you make our portion and our nasib of knowing and understanding and introducing and realizing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the greatest of portion and the greatest of nasib, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we are people of sin, we are people who have wronged ourselves and wronged others. Oh Allah, we, we we seek refuge in you from our, our wrongdoings and the wrong of ourselves and the wrong of others. And we ask you, uh, we ask you to uh, for repentance and we turn to you in Tawbah and we turn to you with our empty hands and our empty hearts. Oh Allah, don't allow for our empty hearts to return empty, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Don't allow for our empty hearts to return empty, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, our hearts are precious. Love is precious. Allow it only to be for the countenance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, accept our endeavors towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and increase us in our endeavors towards him, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you for this community for the people of Khidmah and the Khidmah that they are doing for the people of Luton and the surroundings. And oh Allah, we ask you that you increase them and give them goodness and steadfastness upon this religion and allow us and all others to benefit from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you make this Khidmah project a beacon project and a minaret of light to whom people are uh, take guidance from the east and in the west, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we seek refuge in you from our evils, from our wrongdoings, and we ask you for the good that you have, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, and we ask you for the good that you have, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, we are the seeds of your mercy, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. Don't make us the, the harvest of your anger and wrath, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, forgive us 
um, give us and don't deprive us and honor us and don't debase us, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Oh Allah, there are people here who have wishes and have hopes and who have wants before your court. Oh Allah, you know the state of our hearts. You know the wants and the wishes of our hearts. Oh Allah, grant them to each and every one of us, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you make the want and the wish and the love of our, of our heart, Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa zid wa akrim wa an'im wa tammim ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wa waj'al naf'a zalika lana wa li abaina wa ummahatina wa azwajina wa zuriyatina wa ikhwanina wa al-muslimina ajma'in fi mashariq al-ardu wa magharibiha ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa farrij an ummat Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa arham ummat Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akshib al-balaya. والوبايا عن أمة جيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم وهذه الوسيلة والفضيلة والدرجة العالية الرفيعة وبعث مقاما محمودا يضبطه الأولون والآخرون اللهم وحقق آماله في ذريتي وأهل بيتي وفينا وفي المسلمين اللهم وانزله المنزل المقرب عندك يوم القيامة اللهم واجعل لنا النصيب الأوفى والحظ الأوفى منه صلى الله عليه وسلم في هذا الدار وفي تلك الدار وفي جميع الأطوار يا رب العالمين ويا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد و اغفر لنا بجاه سيدنا محمد وارحمنا بجاه سيدنا محمد وتجاوز عنا بجاه سيدنا محمد و... و... وانظر إلينا بجاه سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم واعف عنا واغفر لنا وسامحنا بجاه سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وبارك وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة